Matthew chapter 3 is where we are, Matthew chapter 3. Join me there. Matthew chapter 3. We've been going through the book of Matthew uh, for a little bit now, not, uh, not for too long, but we're here in chapter 3 now. We're going to finish up chapter 3 this week. And last week, if you were here, uh, you remember, if not, I'll remind you, that in Matthew chapter 3, beginning, uh, Matthew introduces a character to the story. We saw Jesus' uh, birth and the circumstances surrounding his birth in chapter 1 and 2. And then, here we are in chapter 3, we got this guy, John the Baptist, on the scene. Remember John the Baptist? Uh, interesting character in the Bible, as far as biblical characters go. One of my favorite, as a matter of fact. Remember, uh, Matthew introduced him as one who lived in the wilderness who wore camel's hair, uh, garments, and a leather belt, and also who uh, ate locusts and wild honey. I didn't point this out. You might have come to this conclusion on your own but uh, last week, but, but you, know, you know how you get wild honey if you live in the wilderness? Like John didn't have a beekeeper suit at this time. John was kind of a rugged, wild man. John is the kind of prophet that I want to be. You know what I mean? Like, I relate to him, not like because I'm like him, just because, like, that's kind of, you know, like, I like to be out in the wilderness for a couple of hours at a time, you know, till it gets cold or hot. Uh, I like to camp for, like, a night. And I mean, like, some of y'all, when you hear camp, you think RV camp, right? When I was, in, uh, when I was younger, growing up, we had a boys' camping trip with the youth group, just a boys' camping trip. And we went out to camp by a lake, and the pastor was coming, our pastor. And uh, I was thought, that's cool. The pastor's going to come camp with us. That's neat. And uh, he pulled up in a 27-foot bumper pool RV <laughs> and plugged into an RV spot. And at one point, I heard him complain that he couldn't get the pilot light on the hot water heater lit. And that's kind of the camping that some people do. John lived in the wilderness, um, and he ate Wild honey that he collected probably by himself. He's also probably a very hairy man. John probably had a big old beard. Now, we believe that because Luke chapter 1 uh, kind of makes us believe that uh, he took the Nazarite vow, which would mean he never cut the hair from his, from his face or the hair from his head. So he probably was just a woolly booger. He probably had one of those beards that, like, leaves get caught in it, and he didn't even realize it. You know, that kind of beard. Big, wild guy. I like to think about John the Baptist. Well... John is introduced in chapter 3 as a prophet, a special prophet, and particularly this forerunner of the Messiah, the one making the path straight for the Messiah, the Savior Jesus, to come. He's out in the wilderness preaching repentance, and people from Jerusalem and all Judea, the area around Jerusalem, will go out to John to be baptized in the Jordan River uh, for repentance. And the first part of John chapter 3 tells us that these people would go out. And so some of the Pharisees and the Sadducees went out, remember? And these Pharisees and Sadducees were these super religious, ultra religious, wore religious garments and robes, self-righteous kind of folks. And we see the first time in John's gospel where, you know, really uh, they get after these guys. Jesus is going to say a lot of negative things about these people because they were self-righteous and, and fake. They weren't really followers of God. They were just kind of fakers. And John tells them, you know, in really harsh terms, he's not going to baptize them. Why are they even there? They're just fakers. They're just self-righteous. He calls them a brood of vipers, which is not a compliment for sure. And so he's out there ministering and baptizing people and preparing people's hearts to hear the message about Jesus. And then somebody shows up to be baptized that... Uh, um, kind of throws John for a loop. It's Jesus. And the thing you see here in the story of the baptism of Jesus uh, is kind of like the, the coronation of a king. You know, before a uh, person of royalty is placed in their position, depending on how high they are, but, but certainly a king or a queen, there'd be a coronation service. I looked up one of the most expensive ones ever, and there was a coronation service. And remember, this is a one-day event, not even a holiday event, like four, five, six-hour event uh, where King George IV of England was uh, coronated the king of England. And that service cost 238 pounds in that day, which in today's money 
would be about $13 million for a one-day event to install this monarch into his position. It's a big, elaborate affair. But think about even in our world that we live in today, when a politician, particularly a president, is elected, they have an inauguration, right? And that's usually a big event. If it's a president, it's maybe difficult to get tickets to that event. Probably costs a lot of money. There's fireworks. There's celebrities. It's a big deal because it's their celebration of them taking office, beginning that position. Well, this event can be seen as Jesus' coronation or his inauguration as the Messiah here on earth. But it's not so elaborate. Join me there in chapter 3 of verse 13. Here's what it says. It says, Then Jesus came from Galilee, that's in the north, that's where Nazareth is, that's where he's from, to uh, John uh, and the Jordan, which is down south around Jerusalem, to be baptized by him. But John tried to stop him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and yet you come to me? Jesus answered, Allow it for now, because this is the way for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then John allowed him to be baptized. When John was baptized, he went up, uh, when, excuse me, when Jesus was baptized, he, he went up immediately from the water. The heaven suddenly opened for him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming down on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Now, I need to remind you, uh, in the course of the story, the context of the whole story, you know, we go through whole books of the Bible here on Sunday mornings because it's all about context. Things have meanings in their context. And the larger context of the whole book of Matthew is this. You know, you have uh, the first two chapters of Jesus' birth and the very, very early part of his life, the miraculous circumstances of all that. And that's chapter 1 and chapter 2. And then um, chapter 3 through chapter 28 is about three and a half years uh, of his life, the last three and a half years of his life, his earthly ministry. So that gap here is about 30 years between when Jesus began his ministry. He's about 30 years old here in John, uh, Matthew chapter 3. According to the, the Gospel of Luke, we know that. So we got a big gap here. Jesus doesn't really start his earthly ministry until this moment. He's about 30 years old. Rabbis in this time would start a public ministry, usually when they reach the age of about 30 years old. You might wonder, why did Jesus wait till he was 30 years old? He could have started when he was 25 or 27 or 29. If you're in your 20s right now, you think, man, there's no reason why he shouldn't have started. I had a seminary uh, president, that uh, his name Paige Patterson. He was the president of the seminary when I went through there. And his idea was this. He said, nobody really cares what you have to say till you're 30 years old. And his point in saying that was, you know, he said, so just stay around the seminary a little longer, get a Ph.D. and stuff like that. That may be his motivation, but that was his perspective. Jesus reached this age where he's going to begin this ministry, and there he goes. He takes off in it. Um, it, it, it first of all, uh, makes you think a few things. It says that Jesus went to John to be baptized by him. You know, that's a very simple statement. It just tells you what was happening, but it's actually really profound why did Jesus go to John to be baptized? It's a big question. What was John's baptism? John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. Repentance means you've sinned and you're turning from your sin to trust and follow God more fully. Had Jesus sinned? Had Jesus done something wrong that he needed to repent of? Was he in need of repentance? Why does Jesus go to John to be baptized. Well, no, I would say no. The Bible presents Jesus as sinless, absolutely sinless, 100% sinless, as a matter of fact. Matter of fact, I think even John's hesitancy testifies to the sinless nature of Christ. But let me give you just a few verses that talk about the sinless nature of Jesus. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, it says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who was tempted in every way as we are and yet without sin. 2 Corinthians 5 says, He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. 1 John 3 says, You know that we, he, ha, he was revealed so that he might take away sins, and there is no sin in him. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 22 said, He did not commit sin, and no deceit was found in him, connecting Jesus to that Isaiah 53 passage. 
So here we have all the major writers of the New Testament mentioned here. Those are the ones that I mentioned, just a few verses. There's a lot more, but they all attest to the fact that Jesus lived his whole life here on earth and did not sin one time, not a single time. Can can you imagine that? Friends, could, could you imagine going a single day without thinking a thought you should probably not have thought, without getting frustrated and upset, Maybe saying a word you shouldn't say. You say, yeah, I could imagine that. That day if I was in a coma, right, that's about it. If I was knocked out, yeah, I could probably imagine pulling that off. Jesus lived his whole life that way. Not a single time did Jesus disobey his parents. Incredible. A few few kids getting slapped right now, praise God. Praise God. Think about even Jesus' trial before Pilate, and we'll get there in Matthew But Jesus' trial before Pilate, they bring him before Pilate, and Pilate says, okay, what'd he do? What's his charge? And and the Pharisees literally say, well, you know, if he wasn't a criminal, we wouldn't have brought him to you. That's it. That's all they got. That's all they got. And and, and listen, they they say, well, he he said he was going to destroy the temple. Jesus said, destroy this temple, and I'll raise it up in three days. He's talking about his body. They literally don't have a single charge to make against Jesus. Listen, and and they didn't need a big crime, right? They didn't need a murder or robbery or something, right? They just needed one thing he did wrong. And they couldn't find anybody to say one thing he did wrong. If he did one thing wrong, then he wasn't the sinless son of God. They couldn't find a single person. Let me ask you, friend, how hard would it be to find somebody in your life who could attest to the fact that you had done something wrong at some point? How hard would it be? If you were on trial, right? That person is likely sitting next to you, friend, on that row today. They wouldn't have to look far in your life or my life. Absolutely, right? You could find somebody who said you did something wrong, and that's all they needed. One person to say he did one thing wrong, one time, they can find no one. It's a trumped-up charge, a rush trial, because that's all they got. He's absolutely sinless. John's baptism, remember, is a baptism of repentance. So what does Christian baptism look like? John's baptizing. How do we baptize today? Is our baptism different? Our our baptism, I knew a preacher used to call it getting baptized. And that's what he said. That's how he said it every time, baptized. I don't know if he had a uh, lisp or what, but maybe I'm joining him. But um, Christian baptism is a little bit different. That's what I was trying to say. Uh, We don't just have a baptism of repentance. We have a baptism that relates us with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, right? It's a sacred symbol. That's what it is for us. It's a command of obedience. The picture in the Bible is this. Repent and be baptized. So Christian baptism, as it's spelled out in the New Testament, is a baptism of believers. People who have put their faith in Jesus should then be baptized, not the other way around. Some uh, faith traditions, even Protestant ones, baptize children, infants. And the reason why they do that is they believe that that baptism imparts some, a certain amount of grace towards that child. It will uh, lead God to put faith in that child's heart. Now listen, now friend, listen, listen, listen. It, 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 if that were true, if we thought that might even maybe be true, don't you think we would do that? Like, like in my own life, for my own child, if, if I thought by, by baptizing my child as an infant that that would make her more likely to receive Jesus one day, that God's grace would be upon her in some way or another, we would 100% do it. But you know what we would do? Because we're good Baptists? We would just call it something different. You know what I mean? Just rename it. We'd have a pool party and just get all of them, right? Or, I don't know. But the problem with that is that idea is just really not what the Bible presents as Christian baptism. It's just not there. It came about through tradition and teaching apart from the Bible. As a matter of fact, we don't believe that um, baptism, even as a believer, imparts grace. It's a step of obedience. God commands it, so we do it. It's an outward expression of an inward reality. And so that's why Jesus steps into this water as obedience. 
But why? He had no sin. Well, when we're baptized, uh, we do so because we've related with his sinlessness. And what we're saying is we are not the person we used to be. We're not. We've been changed. We're not perfect, but we've been made holy because of the blood of Jesus. So it's an outward expression of something that's changed in our hearts, that's true in our hearts. Think about this in regard to Jesus. His uh, submission to God is absolute. His obedience to God is unquestioned. So his baptism is an outward symbol of an inward reality. Not that he's changed, but that he has been united or is united with God the Father. You also notice that he does this publicly. That's also uh, a characteristic of Christian baptism, I believe, is that it should be public. And that, in that sense, it should be with the assembled church. So sometimes people will come to me and ask me for a private baptism. Uh, and they're usually because they're shy, right? They don't want to be up in front of people, and I understand that. Uh, here's the problem with that, though. You can't have a private testimony, right? If it's supposed to be a testimony, it's got to be public. It's got to be out loud. And if baptism saved a person and Jesus went and got baptized, you, you got to deal with that. But since baptism doesn't save you, it doesn't impart grace, Jesus doing it is a testimony of the sacred symbol. So Christians get baptized publicly as believers by immersion. By the way, the word baptiz, baptizo in the Greek is literally to immerse, completely surround. You could immerse somebody without dipping them, but you'd have to be like a waterfall or something, right? You'd have to be a ton of water just surrounding you completely. This is why we do what we do, how we do it. So Jesus gets baptized. Why does he get baptized? Well, um, there's a few ideas out there. Let me throw a few. In the Old Testament, a king, before they became king, would be anointed with oil. Sometimes Old Testament prophets would be anointed with oil. Some people say this is Jesus' anointing to be the king, the king of kings. It's one idea. Another one is that uh, before a priest could begin their priestly service, they would have to be washed with water as kind of a ritual of being washed as a priest before they started their priestly service. And Jesus is our great high priest according to the book of Hebrews. So, you know, there's maybe something to that. Another idea is that Jesus is out there to endorse the ministry of John the Baptist. Certainly God endorses the ministry of John the Baptist. And so I think there's probably something to this. John is certainly God's messenger. And, and, and it's interesting to point out that between the book of Malachi and the Old Testament... In the book of Matthew in the New Testament, 400 years go by. And theologians call that the 400 silent years, the intertestament, intertestamental period. And there's no prophet recorded to be speaking on behalf of God in those years. So many believe that God was silent for those 400 years between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And so if John the Baptist is the, the first real prophet of the New Testament... God then is speaking once again to his people Israel, and Jesus can be testifying to that fact. And God even speaks from heaven audibly in this, on this occasion as Jesus is coming up out of the water. So that could be it. I think more uh, likely the reason why Jesus got baptized is to set an example for us. You know, uh, a lot of what Jesus did here on earth was to set an example for us, right? I mean, you know, he, he came to earth and he taught, performed miracles. But oftentimes the, the Bible points to Jesus as our example, right? We should be sinless and pursue sinlessness and, and, and not sin and turn away from sin because Jesus was sinless. He's holy. Be holy because he is holy. That's kind of our picture as an example. So I think maybe the biggest reason is that Jesus set an example for us to follow. And so let me ask you this question. If, if Jesus needed to be baptized, don't you think you do? And, and notice when Jesus is baptized. He's baptized before his earthly ministry kicks off. That's why we call it this coronation of his ministry, this inauguration of his ministry. So, so that's why we say you, you get saved, become a follower of Jesus, your next step, if you can, is to be baptized, to begin your earthly walk with the Lord, to begin your earthly ministry here on earth. Because that's what God's called you when he called you to be a believer. 
And, you know, you have uh, John the Baptist here, and he's uh, looking at this event, and he, he tries to stop Jesus. Did you notice that? Now, he doesn't do so like Peter did. Remember when Peter tried to stop Jesus? Uh, at one point, Jesus is going to wash the feet of the disciples to demonstrate, you know, servant leadership. The greatest among you must be the least. And what does Peter say? Hmm. Nope. You're not, you're, not, you're not washing my feet, Jesus. No way. Forbid it. No, I, I'm, I'm not having that. That's not right. You should, I should be washing your feet, right? John doesn't quite go that far as Peter. Most people don't go quite as far as Peter in the New Testament. But John says to him, and you can even hear like the, the trepidation in his voice as you read these words. He says, I need to be baptized by you, and yet, and yet you come to me to be baptized. You should be the one baptizing me, Jesus. I shouldn't be baptizing you. See, he's testifying to the sinless nature of Jesus. But there's a contrast here in chapter 3. When you're studying the Bible and you see a contrast in characters, always pay attention. That's intentional. The contrast here, there's, there's two, I think. But between, uh, in chapter 3, you see John stopping who being baptized? Pharisees and the Sadducees, right? Why? Because they were sinners, but they wouldn't repent, right? They were self-righteous, but they wouldn't truly turn from their sins. So he stops them, and he tries to stop Jesus from being baptized for the exact opposite reason. Do you see that? He tries to stop Jesus from being baptized because Jesus is not a sinner and has no need of repentance. The Sadducees, they needed repentance and wouldn't do it. Jesus doesn't need repentance. You also see another uh, contrast here. Between the Pharisees and Sadducees, they're the bad guys, they're the villains, oftentimes in the biblical narrative, and John the Baptist. Do you see the contrast there? John the Baptist in saying, I need to be baptized by you, is spelling out his own sinfulness. Isn't that incredible? John the Baptist, the greatest man who ever lived. Jesus said that. The greatest man born of woman. John the Baptist, and yet John the Baptist was still a sinner. The good thing about that, about John the Baptist being a sinner is, though, is he knew he was a sinner. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, they didn't think they were sinners. They thought they were perfect. So he's not self-righteous like them. John the Baptist is not out in the wilderness saying, hey, y'all need to come to me and hear what I got to say because I've got some things to tell you. no. John the Baptist is just preaching repentance. You need to come to God. So there's a contrast there between Jesus and the Pharisees, but also between John the Baptist and the Pharisees. He says, I need to be baptized by you. But Jesus responds, allow it for now. Permit it. It's okay because this is the way for us to fulfill all Righteousness. It says, then John allowed him to be baptized. So Jesus tells him to uh, go ahead and baptize him. John doesn't understand. Oftentimes, John's, uh, God's plan to us is hard to understand. But when John doesn't understand God's plan here in this moment, John obeys God's word. It's a good principle in your life, right? If you don't understand God's plan, continue to obey his word, understanding that his plan is higher than yours. So Jesus tells him, no, 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 it's okay. Allow it because it's necessary to fulfill all righteousness. I think Jesus is saying, look, this is God's plan. This is what we need to do. This is part of what God wants us to do. So allow it. Allow it. Make sure it takes place, and he does. So then you go to verse 16. It says, when Jesus was baptized, he went up immediately from the water you know, John didn't hold him down too long. He made it, I don't know why it says that. He went up immediately from the water. You know, sometimes I tell parents, by the way, um, if you pay extra, we'll baptize your kid a little extra long. Just hold him down. Make sure it takes. That's a joke. Unless you write a check. No, I'm kidding. Um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Pray for me. The heavens suddenly opened for him, and he saw... The Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming down on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. So you have two other characters make an appearance here. That's why it's an incredible moment. It says, The Spirit of God descends 
like a dove. I used to uh, have a friend that would get so mad at me for going dove hunting. He said, you are hunting the Holy Spirit. What's wrong with you? And it doesn't say the Spirit descended as a dove. It just says the Spirit descended like a dove. So it's not an actual bird, okay? Continue to dove hunt if you want. They taste delicious. The Spirit of God, that's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit descends. And then a voice from heaven speaks up. So what you have here is all three members of the Trinity there. The other two members of the Trinity testify to Jesus in this, testify about Jesus in this moment. The Spirit testifies who Jesus is by descending. God from heaven testifies to who Jesus is by speaking. The Trinity there is pictured. There's some groups that don't believe in the Trinity. They believe in uh, God the Father. They believe in Jesus the Son. They may believe in the Holy Spirit. They don't believe they are one, but they are one. That's what the Bible teaches. There is one God, three persons, the Trinity. Uh, some say uh, it's like a pie, and you cut out three pieces of pie. Well, one's the Holy Spirit piece, and one's the Jesus piece, and one's the God the Father piece. And that is heresy. Here's why. <laughs> because when you take out a piece of pie, it's no longer a pie. God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit are three in one at the same time. They are distinct, but they are singular at the same time. You say, I don't understand that. And I would say to you, me either. God's ways are higher than us. We have no thing on earth that's a good example of this. The the doctrine of the Trinity. By the way, those people who uh, like to debate the doctrine of the Trinity will point out that the word Trinity is not actually in the Bible. And I would like to point out out to them that the word Bible is not in the Bible. So there you go. But you have uh, the three here in the water. There you have the Jesus, the Son, Son of God, the Spirit of God. Then you have God the Father saying this. This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. So I... So I, I just imagine, I imagine hearing those words, I, I, it'd be incredible. But it, it, it's literally God the Father from heaven saying, that's my boy down there. That, he's mine. I'm proud of him. I love him. That's, he's mine. You think about that moment in the water. Um, <clears throat> let me ask you this question. How does God feel about you? You see here how God feels about his son, right? How does he feel about his son? He loves him, right? It's my beloved son whom I'm well pleased with. That's how God feels about his son. How does he feel about you? Let me answer that question with a question. How do you feel about his son? Right? This is how God feels about his son. How does he feel about you? Well, how does, how does he see you? Well, how do you see his son? Here's why. When you become a Christian, the Bible says this, you are in Christ. It uses that language. When you, by faith, turn your heart over to God and become a follower of Jesus, the Bible says you are in Christ. It says you are clothed with Christ in the book of Galatians. In Romans, it says you will become a co-heir with Christ. In the book of Colossians, it says you are are now hidden with Christ in God. So, So get the picture there. You're in Christ. You are covered in Christ. You are surrounded by Christ when you become a Christian. So how does God see you? What does God see when he looks at a follower of Jesus, a true follower of Jesus? When he looks at you, Christian, he doesn't see you. He sees his son. How does he feel about his son? It's my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. You think, oh, (laughs) when God sees me, he's probably disappointed, right, because I don't go to church enough. He's disappointed because I don't do this enough or I do this too much or whatever. But listen, this is the, this is the beauty, beauty of justification in Christ. 
is that God the Father, when you come to him for salvation, substitutes your sinfulness with the sinlessness of his son and wraps you in the righteousness of his beloved child. So when God the Father from heaven looks at a believer, no longer sees their failure, he sees the purity and the holiness of his beloved child. How does God see you? Well, how do you see his son? Are are you a follower of Jesus? Have you given your heart and your life to him? Have you been clothed in Christ, hidden in Christ? Are you in Christ today? You say, well, I mean, I'm at church. That's pretty good. It's close. You're close, but you can miss it. You can be in church and miss it. A lot of people come to church and miss it. Just because you go to church doesn't make you a Christian. Just because you go to a garage doesn't make you a car. Just because you go to Germany doesn't make you a Nazi. Just because you go to McDonald's doesn't make you a double, McDouble with cheese, okay? You've got to be in Christ. There's a change. There's something that happens when you put your faith in Jesus and are saved once and for all. 1 John, or excuse me, John chapter 1 says, But to all who receive him... He, be, he gave them the right to become children of God. Have you received him? Have you received him? Heard a story about uh, Rolls Royce. You know, Rolls Royce, as you may know, a very expensive car. And they tout themselves as being the best cars ever made, you know, Rolls Royce. Uh, if you own a Rolls Royce, would you please take me for a ride? I'd love to see the inside of one. But they tout themselves as being the best cars ever made. They have for a long, long time. And the story goes about Rolls-Royce cars that uh, many, many years ago, a very rich man from England bought a Rolls-Royce and then almost immediately took it on a vacation to France. And while in France, his beautiful brand new Rolls-Royce broke down. And so he called the factory in England and told him the problem. Rolls-Royce immediately flew a mechanic to France to repair this vehicle. And while the vehicle is being repaired, Rolls-Royce put this man and his family up in the nicest hotel in the area. When this Englishman arrived back at home, he expected to find a bill for those services, a very sizable bill, he thought, but it never came. Finally, he wrote to Rolls-Royce and asked them for the bill. Would you please send me the bill? They sent him a letter uh, in response, and it said this, Dear Sir, We have no record of anything having ever gone wrong with your car or with any other Rolls Royce. This is the picture of justification in Christ. God has no record of your wrong. Not because he can't remember it, but listen, because in Christ he has chosen to forget it. You say, oh man, I know if God could see me, boy, boy. He doesn't see you that way. He sees his beloved son when he looks at you. So you have these three pictured here. In the water, when Jesus is being baptized, you have all three present. You also have all three present when, uh, in regard to salvation, when a person puts their faith in Jesus. If you think about it for just a moment. God the Father sent his son Jesus to die. Imagine how difficult that was. Jesus, the Son of God, answers the call, obediently goes all the way to the cross. And then the Holy Spirit draws people to salvation, convicts our heart of sin and our need for Jesus. Here's what's incredible. Very likely, the Holy Spirit is doing that work right now. Isn't that incredible to think about? There may be somebody in this room that right now the Holy Spirit is stirring your heart, drawing you to this beautiful gospel that we've seen in the waters of baptism of Jesus this morning. This beloved son, Jesus, in the water was also his beloved son on the cross. And because that cross wasn't, it didn't have just any old man on the cross, because that was the sinless Savior the Son of God, the beloved Son of God the Father, because it wasn't just some guy 
but it was the sinless Son of God, that sacrifice could forever save everyone who would submit their life to God and be saved. It's a big enough sacrifice to pay for your sins, to cover, to clothe, to hide, to wash away your sins. God the Father's done his part. Jesus has done his part. The Holy Spirit is doing his part. Are you going to do your part today and answer the call? Give your heart and your life to Jesus. Would you pray right now? Heads bowed, eyes closed, nobody looking around. Would you just take a moment of prayer? And I want to ask you to answer that question. Just between you and God this morning, knowing, understanding, believing God has done his part and done everything necessary for your salvation. Knowing that right now, that that feeling you feel, that urge you feel, is not just your brain, not just indigestion from whatever you ate last night, But it's God's Holy Spirit drawing your heart to Him. Knowing all of that, have you personally asked Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior? Have you began that relationship? Have you received Him as Lord? If not, do it right now, right where you're sitting. Don't wait another moment. It's crazy to wait another moment. Don't put it off. You don't even know if you have another moment. Right where you're at right now this morning, pray and ask Jesus to come into your heart, forgive your sins, and be your Lord and Savior once and for all. Just between you and God, would you pray this morning? that are here this morning that have been saved, you've asked Jesus into your heart, you know you have a relationship with him. I just wonder if there might be a few that are here this morning that have been racked with guilt and shame. Your, your, Your walk with Jesus is not characterized by grace and peace. It's characterized by shame, guilt, You think God from heaven looking down on you with disgust and disappointment? And here's the problem with that. You know, I don't think guilt and shame bring us closer to Jesus. You know what does bring us closer to Jesus? Repentance and obedience. So if there's sin in your life, repent. Forsake it. Turn back to God right now. Commit to obey him with your life. And put away the guilt. Put away the shame. Often that drives you farther from God. It doesn't bring you closer to him. Understand he's there with loving arms to receive his children this morning. Here in just a moment, we're going to have our invitation time. And that's when we invite you to respond to what God may be doing in your heart and your life this morning. So if you're here today and this morning you prayed for the very first time and asked Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, or maybe you prayed for the hundredth time uh, that prayer, but today you're serious, you're sincere, you mean it. Not just words, not just a religious activity like the Pharisees, but in your heart between you and God, you know it's real and you're serious and sincere. If that's you today, I want you to take a step of faith here in just a moment. Walk down these aisles and talk to me or one of the other guys down here with me.
We want to celebrate that with you today. If you've given your heart and your life to Jesus, that is a reason to celebrate. And we want to do that with you this morning. If you're here today and you hear all this talk about baptism and you've, you've not been baptized, you need to follow through. You've been wrestling with being baptized. You've followed Jesus, but you haven't taken that, that step of obedience. I challenge you today to make that commitment to be baptized. And you can do that this morning. We stand, you come down here, and we'll talk to you about that, and we'll get that scheduled. We'll get that figured out. Make that commitment to follow through today. Or thirdly, maybe uh, you're here today, and God has drawn you to First Baptist Church, and you know this is where he's got you. It's where he wants you to be, and you need to make that official by becoming a member of First Baptist. That's what he's laid on your heart. If that's the case, he invites you to come at this time as well. So would you stand? Everybody stand. And if you need to come, you come. We'll You're celebrate it with you. the voice of love that's calling. There's a chair that waits for you. And a friend who understands everything you're going through. can see the weight you carry The fears that hold your heart Through the cross you've been forgiven You're accepted as you are So bring it all to the table Nothing he ain't seen before For all your sin, all your sorrow and your sadness There's a Savior and he calls Bring it all to the table standing at a distance in the shadows of your shame there's a light of hope that's shining won't you come and take your place and bring it all to the table Nothing he ain't seen before For all your sin, all your sorrow and your sadness There's a Savior and he calls Bring it all to the table Be seated for just a moment. Just be seated for a moment. Uh, we have a family to present this morning. You guys want to go ahead and come? Thank you. <clears throat> Here, come on. This is uh, Luke and Jessica and Trace and Natalie Wood, and they come this morning wishing to unite with our church and become members by statement of faith. And so we're excited to have them. Aren't we excited? <laughs> Amen. And they've been uh, been here and attending for, for a few weeks now, right? A, couple, a few months. Months, actually, yeah. And so, man, we're just excited to have them. Been going to Saint school. So uh, it's a good day, right? It's always a good day. God brings people to our fellowship, and we're excited about that. Be sure and tell them you're excited. Let's go ahead and see. Absolutely. And then uh, let me remind you a few things in our, our church bulletin. I always take your church bulletin there. Um, we are still collecting our uh, annual missions offering from December uh, through January. To the end of January, we'll be collecting our missions offering. Last I saw, we were like 130 bucks from meeting our goal which is praise God. So about 10 or 12 of you write that $130 check and we'll get there. Uh, just joking, just joking. Uh, also our playground fund. We're raising money to build a playground out here. Uh, the updates there in the financial report on your bulletin. So check that out. Remind you to pray about giving to that. Our gentleman in the back to receive our offering now. And so we'll do that on our way out. I wanna pray for us and I'll close in prayer. Um, but just reminder this week, Wednesday night, all of our Wednesday night activities are on. So our youth group, ages seven, grade 7 through 12, meets in the back back here. Our kids, 
uh, meet right here. Our nursery is going on for our adult Bible study, which meets in the fellowship hall after we eat. We eat at 5.30. Everybody breaks up. All the adults stay in there for Bible study. We're going through the book of Daniel in there right now. It's been fun. So join us for those. Make plans to attend. And uh, then we'll see you there, and we'll see you back here next Sunday. Let me pray for us, and you'll be dismissed today. God, we love you. We thank you so much for bringing us here today to worship you. Thank you for this picture in the gospel that we see of the baptism of your son. Help us to follow through obediently to walk the plan that you have for us in our lives, each one of us. God, I just pray if anybody's here wrestling with uh, steps of obedience, whether that's salvation, whether that's baptism, whatever it might be in their life, I don't know, but you know, God, would you continue that work on their heart? Give them the courage to be faithful. It's difficult times, at times for us, God. Would you help us? Would you help them? We love you, Lord. We thank you for bringing us here today. We pray it all in your wonderful name. Amen.